Good evening and welcome to episode three of In at the Side. Um, still in lockdown with the boys. Uh, this evening I'm joined by the regulars Jack Donovan and Neil Williamson. And we've got former USA Sevens player and now World Rugby commentator Dan Stanford. How are you, Dan? Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky time in our lives, isn't it? You know, uh, it's a, a lot has changed very quickly, but uh, at least we've got time for more podcasts during the lockdown. So that's positive. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, uh, what are you filling your days with now? So, if I'm not commentating my neighbours who are just, you know, bringing <laughs> groceries into the house or... <laughs> I did doing... see some of those videos there. Yeah, yeah, that was class. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, it's kind of crazy. So, my schedule, uh, it, it, uh, it really is based on the weekends and based on, you know, rugby matches <laughs> that are going on um, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And with Major League Rugby really kicking into gear this year... My schedule and with the sevens, it was literally from the 1st of February till the end of June was every single weekend something was on. Wow. And, I, and so you can imagine how busy that is. Sometimes it'd be flying to two different states on the weekend to do two, two different uh, matches. And one weekend, I think I had three in a row which because it was going to be over Labor Day weekend, which is kind of unique. So three cities in three days calling six teams. Um, to having nothing right now. So um, it's, uh, it's been qu quite a change. I do have one job I do, which is um, actually consulting for a non-profit here in the U.S. called Friends of the British Council, and they work with Premiership Rugby out of the U.K. to um, help coach development and education of the USA coaches. So it's kind of um, um, managing that exchange between the two countries. So it's quite an quite a, a, a yeah. interesting project, very worthwhile the only issue is part of that program is sending our U.S. coaches to the U.K. for a week, which obviously we can't do right now. So yeah. we're going to put that back to later in the year. Um, so doing a bit of work for that. But outside of it, um, just uh, spending spending some quality time at home with the missus and uh, and the two cats. Fair play. So talking MLR, obviously the world is on lockdown. Rugby has unfortunately altogether stopped. How do you think that's going to affect a relatively new league such as the MLR? Obviously, because when it first started, it did, you know, halter, you know, to, to begin with. So it's just got the ball rolling. Social media is big on it now. It's now a hot topic. I think, obviously, it's a lot bigger than when it was when it first launched. And how do you think this, this whole pandemic is going to affect this? Well, first, first I will say um, it, 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 the exciting thing is the, how this differs from the previous professional setup is that the previous one called Pro Rugby had one owner who managed all the teams. And if that owner had uh, an issue, you know, the league could collapse, which it did. Um, and so the nice thing about this, it's more of a, like a major league soccer uh, independently owned uh, setup. And so they went from seven teams the first year to nine teams and now 12 teams to 2020. There are two more teams that bought in for next year. The, the the excitement is there, as you said, there's some of the stadiums are filling up, which is great, three or 4,000 seaters, and that's positive to see huge social media following, big names coming in, all black, yeah. uh, you know, Buster Rowe, Ben Foden, um, the beast from South Africa, so I think that really has galvanized the community as well. The, the tricky aspect, as you mentioned now, is now that it's shut down, the season can't continue, some of the owners, I think, will have some financial issues because of having to pay everybody, uh, the, the players out, and no income coming in. So I, I think there'll be some movement. The league will continue for sure. And one or two owners may buy, buy some of the other teams up. So that may happen, um, which obviously is tricky when you have, uh, you know, owning two or three three sides. But I will say the thing's here to stay. It's going to expand. Um, I, I foresee down the line being 20 teams and, you know, maybe even more. Um, and so there's, there's, there's a lot of um, excitement going on here. Saying that, of course, USA Rugby then has filed for bankruptcy, yeah. two, two, two separate organizations, so it, it really won't affect Major League Rugby as much, um, but it is going to be a very interesting you know, month or two as USA Rugby kind of gathers and see what they do with that, you know? So, yeah, so, um, sorry, Dom. As I say, touching what you said there, obviously, with, um, with the coronavirus and, and, and rugby in the in, in USA, do you see it having a, a long-term effect on the sport? Um, I know, obviously... Short term, financially, it can you know, really ruffle some feathers like it has done over here, like it has done with every other business. But do you think rugby, the actual outlook of it or, or rugby as, as a whole over there will be affected long term by it? I think it will. Um, sport, sports in general, I think, is what, you know, everybody's thinking of. Um, and so gathering in, in, in stadiums and doing that, I, I, it will definitely change. 
I don't know how it will look, and again, which is so interesting, it's it's a day-by-day -day thing, isn't it, you know? Um, e even the way it was reported here initially, you know, uh, by our president, um, was that it wasn't a big deal initially, and then all of a sudden it became absolutely massive and critical. So I, I think things will certainly change in the sporting arena landscape, but I, I do hope return to normal there may be obviously some 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 issues going through until that um i think it's still early too early for us to tell uh, yeah. obviously i know that some 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 organizations will may even have some remote setups like so so on the commentary side of it like uh, this past week i did an interesting thing where we um uh, we, i sat at home obviously we had a usa player sitting at, at their home and we re comment we re, re spoke about a game that was played so kind of like director's cut if you would have a movie but yeah. not a game yeah. more remote options of that now when it's live sports um you know you obviously you can play behind closed doors but then again you're still assembling your teams and mm -hmm. still people have to be there to set it up so it's not as easy as um, you know, like in Japan, the Rugby World Cup, when the Typhoon was coming, they were like, well, why don't we just move the players to a safe area, play yeah, behind yeah. closed doors, we can still broadcast and commentate the game. And that makes sense for that setup, but not when you're dealing with something like COVID-19. Yeah. No, that's yeah. Fair you think, obviously, um, well, I've coached over in the States a few times. I know a few people have done a bit of work in Chicago coaching-wise, and they've always had their, let's say, opinions on USA Rugby. Do you think this bankruptcy was a long time coming? And it's just been tipped over the edge by the pandemic? Or do you think, had this pandemic not come about, they were going in the right direction and stuff was moving on to a more positive way? Because obviously, I think uh, I was speaking to one of my friends the other day. Um, he mentioned, I think it was last year's Youth Summit or this year's Youth Summit got cancelled. And he's just, you know, a lot of people are very critical of the organisation. So I was wondering if, you know, was this a long time coming or is this just a new thing? Yeah, good point. Um, so I, I came to the US uh, 2003, around about that time period. So I've seen the governing body, you know, over at least almost two decades. And my, my issues with it were that the people at the top were getting paid far too much money for what the game was worth in the US. Yeah. And the people that really mattered, it, it's the community, right? And, and I think what sets, us, sets rugby apart is that you've got excitable people that are looking to make a difference in their community in any way they can. And so... The people really have, have have driven the numbers up of the game. So so back in the day, the governing body were understaffed, paying their high CEOs way too much money, and really not doing a good enough job. The states is a complicated rugby landscape because of having so many geographical areas spread out and climate so different, time zones even in the same country. So a yeah. lot of people, you know, who come from other countries like myself would be like, oh, this why doesn't rugby function like it does in South Africa or England or anywhere else around the world? Well, the, the differences here are, are, are so major and so uh, so crazy. There are a lot of um, uh, people that, you know, are in it for the love of the game, and I think that's, that's what really drives it. So to answer your question about USA Rugby, unfortunately, USA Rugby has been, you know, breaking even all, all across the years. There were a couple of good years where the All Blacks came and played here in the US, and they did generate some significant income due to um, hosting events. But big issues then came about that. So South Africa uh, came to play here against Wales a few years ago, and they lost a lot of money on that fixture. The Rugby World Cup Sevens, they lost a tremendous amount of money. Uh, it was too expensive. Even though 100,000 people came, it sold out. Yeah. The, the, the actual cost and planning weren't there. And then, unfortunately, US Rugby lost a lot of money trying to uh, uh, do something called the Rugby Channel. And then they had to sell all their rights in the end to an online company. So there have been decisions that have, you know, catapulted into the tremendous issues and COVID-19 they would have gone bankrupt let's be fair even if this yeah. didn't and so that was kind of the, the, the sad part but I think the positive side of it is that the organization will now have to properly make changes structurally to set itself up for success because it's it's got wonderful elements in American big sporting communities of course around and rugby is certainly on on, on the rise for sure yeah. and, and, and so saying all that it is amazing to to think how well the USA men and women have done in the sevens game. You know, with with all these hamstring issues, not getting paid much money. Um, and I remember back in the day when I was playing, we got paid one hundred dollars a day as a player, and we were going up against you know opponents from other countries who were getting a hundred thousand dollars a year and full time rugby players. And we you know did our day job, train in the yeah. evening to afternoon, assemble the week before the tour, and go play on some way on the series. Um, and so that has changed, obviously, but it's still. You know, amazing how the athletes can compete uh, uh, given the environment. Yeah, that's good. So obviously, 
USA Sevens is a different entity to USA Rugby, I believe. So do you think they're going to look to learn from the success of USA Sevens? Obviously, I imagine the on-field success breeds into the back offices of the organisation. But, you know, is there something that can be learned? Are they paying high high fine executives? Yeah, so with with the so the tricky thing which I didn't mention there is that in most countries the governing body runs their HSBC Sevens World Series tournament. Most in the US, unfortunately, the rights were sold very early on to outside entities, and so one of them actually did a brilliant job. Uh, that was um, a John Prismax Group. They took the, the Sevens from um, uh, Los Angeles, moved it to San Diego, and then took it to um, uh, uh, Las Vegas. They had 10 years in Vegas, and they brought in, uh, at times, sometimes between 30,000, 35,000 people per day, uh, which is a massive and a huge success. So that generated a lot of money, but not for USA Rugby. It generated money for that organization, and they grew the game in other parts as well, which is great. Unfortunately, um, John Prusmack passed away, and so the rights apparently went then to tender, and um, uh, another group bought it, AEG uh, uh, bought it, and they put it on in Los Angeles. Now, while it wasn't a massive success due to attendance numbers, um, it will take a while to, to grow for sure. But I think that's where US Rugby is missing out, is having that partnership where they get a revenue share of the tournament itself, um, which will lend to paying its players. But the real issue is that the US Rugby is struggling to get income, and their main income source is uh, uh, membership dues from the the whole of the United States, yeah. and then most of that money goes to paying for the high performance teams, your 15 aside team and your seven aside team. So, I know a lot of people say we don't need. Some people say we don't need our national teams. Now, obviously, I disagree because you need your national product and you need your national product to be fairly strong. While well, the yeah. 15 aside yeah. and the men's side hasn't been strong, the women's has and the sevens have been. So, those kind of things, especially with the Olympics coming up, that's how you do generate more income and more sponsors is when your women and your men's sevens teams medal or do brilliantly and, you know, really uh, um, align itself with the people watching in the U.S. I think that will be a game changer. It didn't happen in 2016, as everybody thought it would in America. We're hoping for it to happen in now 2021. Um, yes, obviously. Um, so go on, Donovan. Uh, just a couple of things on what you were saying, Donovan. Um, first thing you were saying about sort of how the growth of the game is going on and everything. Um, obviously, Mike Friday's come over that, and through social media, etc., have been seeing various outreach programs that the Sevens Boys and Mike Friday have started to do in the community. A lot of nations around the globe appear to use the Sevens circuit almost as a feeder to give international experience for players who could be breaking through. Do you think that could actually be a process that could cause a link for USA Rugby in the future? And how could that possibly develop? So you, you bring up a brilliant point about um, uh, some of the leading nations using uh, Sevens as, the, as that vehicle. It, it, particularly New Zealand is one that springs to mind. They've probably produced the most uh, All Blacks out of their Sevens programs. Um, and actually, <laughs> speaking of which, so there I am playing for the USA many years ago. And, you know, our team is, as we were saying, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, players that work full time and then play rugby on the side and, and, and try your best there. And the opposite number to me was uh, Israel Dag. Uh, as a young kid, he scored wow. three tries against us, and everyone's like, "Who's this kid?" And then a few year, a year or two, he's playing for the All Blacks. So yeah. they've certainly done their job with that. Uh, a couple other countries have used that as well. Now, this is where it gets interesting because Sevens is now full time professional, and your squads are most more than likely contracted year round to play Sevens. There is that path that's breaking off where you're you're choosing between being a fifteen aside professional or a seven aside, and rarely can you switch across. Um, thinking of the USA, they had two players in their team, Ben Pinkelman and Martin Yosefo, two real stars on the Sevens World Series, played in Japan for the USA in the Rugby World Cup. And that was great experience for them. Uh, it was tough for them to transition. They were saying back and forth between 15s and 7s, having just been in a 7s environment. I think in North America more so, like Canada as well, it, it's a, it's a, you don't have a greater depth in pool, your pool. So you're going to have to play 7s and 15s as well to be successful at both. I don't think it's necessarily the answer, though, to have a lot of your players do that. You've got your, like, Roscoe Speckmans or Sibela Sinatlas of South Africa that are electric in both codes, and they can make the switch and, and choose to, to do one or the other, like Jason Colby. They're trying to get him back for the Olympic Games. But it is, um, I think the game is now progressing 
where you, you don't want most of your squad to do that. You can breed a couple of youngsters coming because the thing that's about sevens, which you all love, is that you have so much space and time on defense and attack. And those skills really are, are you can see them in the 15 aside game if someone plays that, you know. So hopefully that answers your question. But I think the game is branching off into two different real, real, real codes, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, the other thing that I was going to ask as well, you sort of touched on it again. Um, I apologize if this is one of the questions that either of you lads are going to ask. Obviously, you were saying about the Olympics coming up and everything. We've just had sort of the British and Irish Lions tours change and everything. And now you've got players who could be preparing for the 15 aside there from both Great Britain, uh, Ireland, and also uh, South Africa. How do you feel? Do you feel that's going to more be a player's choice or more a governing body choice over? which entity they're going to represent, whether it's going to be the 15 aside representative or whether it is going to be the chance for the Olympic Games. So that is a very tricky one, right? It's uh, now that the timelines have just been merged slightly. Um, look, I, I think speaking from a player's perspective, the you, you, you have different goals and different dreams that you're looking to do. And playing in the Olympic Games is something that we've never had a chance. You know, uh, we missed out at me as a player uh, in our era. So I think, as a, from a player's point of view, to play in the Olympic Games, there is few things will rival that. Of course, playing international rugby, fifteen aside, is is the ultimate as well for a player. So I think it's I think it should be the player's choice to decide what they would like to do. While I do understand that they're being paid from different unions and organisations and different teams, and I know that France came under heat a while back when they wouldn't allow their players to play international rugby because you're being paid top dollar to play for our French club, you know. And so I do understand that. But at the same time, I feel like if you have a chance to play in the Olympic Games and you're good enough and you can make the side and do it, then then that's your priority, whatever you want to do. And you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be, grudge shouldn't be held against you from any coaches if you choose, you know, to to, to give it a go. Now, saying that, that is very tough too. I know speak, I was speaking with the South African coaches recently and they were saying that while a couple of 15 aside stars from the Springboks may want to play in the Olympic Games, they wouldn't necessarily allow them to unless it's somebody they've kept an eye on and they've seen who's transferred back and forth. Like Colby is a good example. If he was available, he would be somebody that could slot in. But not everybody can, can do a good job. You know, we had the Sonny Bill Williams and, and players like that that came back last time. And the impact wasn't as large as some people thought it would be. Yeah, so you talk about some players coming back. Obviously, you had Hain played for Fiji for a few performances, I believe, to try and get right. the Olympic squad. Do you think... Obviously, stuff like that. Coming back to the sevens game is harder than going to the fifteens game. Would you say? Yes, I would say. And and in fact, that's what when I was speaking to Ben Pinkerman and Martin Yosefa, they said because I because they've only been in the seven setup. I said, how hard was it to go to fifteens? And they said, actually, it wasn't. It was when they came back to sevens again after being used to fifteens. And, yeah. and I don't know what they mean. For example, like in sevens. You know, you only need one person at a ruck, so you don't all flood to the ball. Where 15s, if you just do one second too late, you've lost possession. So those kind of small things are very tough to change. And and Jared Hayne and players like that, while they are gifted and amazing, it takes a little while to get into the groove of sevens. And so if you have a few more tournaments, which it seems like we will have now, to develop into the Olympic Games, because now it's 2021, those players may come back and, and be trialed out. Like I remember Brian Abana came came back for South Africa, played in Las, the Las Vegas Sevens, and and it was tough for him. He was, you know, he was like, man, these these players are actually really fast. Now <laughs> Abana was like an ultimate legend. So for him to say that, yeah. you know, Sevens is kind of like it, it's it's a young man's game is is amazing to hear. Nah, that's good. Um, what else can we talk about? So obviously um, USA hoping for new things there. Um, Eddie Jones also news in the week got a new contract what do you uh what do you think of that obviously been very good for england most successful coach for this country ever 78 percent win rates yeah i think, I think it's class think, that, sorry sorry carry on would you class that as most successful though i'm just being devil's advocate here because he hasn't won a world cup i technically i wouldn't class that as successful as as um you know um well as, as okay so, yeah then highest win rate Okay. Yeah. I, I, exactly. I would. I, I would also go with the, the. You know, what's in the cabinet? The World Cup win, obviously. The only. The only Northern Hemisphere side to do so. You know, um, yeah. which is pretty remarkable. Um, I will say that's massive news for for England, and that's fantastic. Um, the, uh, the other day I was watching uh, due to the quarantine, there's more TV being viewed, and there was a little thing about. Uh, 
uh, I think the 2015 World Cup, and it was really, really cool to see some of the highlights of Japan winning with Eddie Jones being yeah. their coach, you know, and, and going strong. Obviously, he's he's a he's a, a media's uh, a dream because he says such interesting and weird and wonderful things. Um, but as a coach and a strategist, he is obviously one of the best in the world, and so I think that's really good for England. Uh, uh, that England game, just to talk about England for a second, uh, in the World Cup against New Zealand, it was unbelievable, unbelievable, and and I know that the final wasn't, um, a, 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 you know, a game that most want to reflect on for as an England fan, but just shows you that Eng a strong England side is what world rugby needs. You need England to be so powerful, and I remember during the Rugby World Cup thinking. Well, even though New Zealand beat South Africa, that their path to the final was way more difficult when you have to play England uh, in the knockout rounds, you know. So Eddie yeah. Jones is going to be is going to be tough for the sides that do face England uh, coming up. I didn't think that South Africa did to us what we did to New Zealand and literally just shut us down. Literally, yeah. shut us down. You're, you're, and it goes to show that any team can beat any team on their day, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, you're home to spot on. I will say though, the English media did, you know, rightly because it was such a massive story. Maybe that got to you know the players during the week. They were quite confident after beating the All Blacks, and you yeah. could see, sense in the first ten minutes of the game they were they weren't quite there physically and and you know mentally. Mm. Yeah, no, that's true. That's exactly. True. So yeah, um, obviously, good progression wise. Who do you think they're going to? Obviously, Steve Borthwick now gone to Leicester, I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, would you look at him coming back to the end of the twenty twenty three World Cup? Take over Eddie Jones. Yeah, look, I think I, I, I'm not I'm not following uh, you know the English coaching setup as as much, but it, it, it is it is important I think to keep to keep some of the knowledge inside the camp, you know, and so I have people closely aligned with it. Um, I'm sure closer to the time there will be a lot of because that job is big, you know, to have the English coaching job. I know even when John Mitchell uh, got asked to help out Eddie Jones last time, you know, as as a specialist, people would jump at the at that role, you know, so. Um, Having somebody that though that's been in the camp or been there done that, I think, is important for for a country, you know. Um, so we'll we'll see how that goes, I suppose. Well, I gave him a card when I met him at King's Home, so uh, I'm still waiting for him to give me a call and say he needs a hat, but uh, you know, maybe he's lost it. Um, but yeah, um, I just wanted to touch on something else, uh, Dylan. Obviously, you know, you you've been good enough to do us a support video in the past. Um, you know, mentioning the, the Dodger Sevens and and asked you know, um, cause that we're trying to promote, which is men's mental health awareness. Um, basically, um, a, ch a question sort of along the lines of that. Um, obviously, you played for many years. Um, obviously, you must have loved your sport. Um, and it was very hard, I imagine, to, to hang your boots up when that time came. A um, couple of questions on that. When you stopped playing, um, was it, did, have you already decided you're going to go to commentary, stra commentary straight away? Um, or had, was there a period of, uh, right, I really need to do something now and then look into things. Um, and doing that, do you think that lessened the blow that it may have had to you mentally going from playing rugby 24 hours a day or 24-7 to then retiring effectively? Yeah, so, so and, that's, and that's brilliant you bring it up. So my, my main thing when I was growing up as a youngster, my father always said to me, I was massively keen on the sport of rugby and, and like any youngster wanted to play for your country and do anything like that. So he, he was very, very instrumental in saying that, you know, you need to get your studies done. You need to have some backups because while you love the sport of rugby and you may be involved for many years in it, um, you should have something else that, that, that you focus on as well. And I think that was very important. Um, and so I got my, my, I studied marketing and advertising and sales and that sort of thing. And so I always knew that the sport was, was an uh, avenue I could explore, but it wasn't going to be something that I could always rely on. So I think that's important for all athletes to realize that there's going to be a time when you retire and it might be on your terms, it might not be on your terms, and you could potentially work in the sport. Um, and so for me, uh, playing rugby was obviously you know, a dream to play for South Africa. I left an immigrant and came to the US and the door opened up there. I didn't even know I was eligible to play for another country. So quick story there. So when I got a call from the USA Sevens coach after a tournament, he said, Dan, I want you to come to tryouts. And I said, oh, thank you. Trying out for what? And he goes, for the USA team to play in the Sevens World <laughs> Series. I said, oh, that, that's a huge honor, but I'm South African. And he's yeah. like, yeah, you married an American citizen and you never played for South Africa. If you, As soon as you have been in your new country for three years, that was the, the rule at the time, then you're edu eligible to play. So it was kind of funny because we ran out in um, uh, my first tournament uh, 
were, uh, was in New Zealand at the Wellington Sevens, and Born in the USA was the song that played from Bruce Springsteen as we all ran out. And we looked around, and six out of the 12 were born in America. The other six of us were foreigners, but, you know, America was our adopted country. So I think that, that's pretty amazing. But to answer your question, um, I was always interested in, in working in media or something around that. So while I was playing, I was looking at opportunities and seeing, could I do this? Could I do that? And straight off the playing, I actually was the media manager for the USA uh, governing body and got a chance to go to the Sevens World Cup in Russia, got a chance to go to New Zealand at the 2011 World Cup and those kind of things. So I always kind of kept up with skills that were relevant to the industry. Commentary was something that I hadn't got an opportunity to do until uh, 2012. And when that happened, I was like, hold on, you can get paid talking about rugby. <laughs> yeah. and like, there's, Everyone's this doing jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then go to these amazing tournaments and destinations around the world. So... Um, that was obviously something that came later, but what, what I will say to all athletes is that, you know, have a backup plan and have things you're generally interested in because at the end of the day, you're going to be working until you're much older in life. So rather do something that you love, right? Something and that you're passionate about. And uh, it's my wife does get irritated with me talking about rugby 24-7 because all my jobs are rugby, right? They're all related somehow to the sport, but that's because I think it's one of the best games and teaches life's most valuable lessons to people. That's what yeah. I'd say. Well, with, with um, the seven circuit in particular, uh, and obviously you've you played 15s and 7s, um, what, what, what we found, I, I know I speak on behalf of a lot of the Dodgers, is that we all play for different 15s clubs um, all over the country. But when we get together, the community spirit and the team spirit and almost the family spirit is second to none. I've never experienced it anywhere else other than when we play sevens and go to these big tournaments and everyone's camps over and the atmosphere it just seems so different it, like i uh, i seem now to my 15 season seems to be a warmer to seven whereas before i would find something to fill the gap in between you know the, the end of the 15 season and the start of the next one um have you experienced that yourself is that uh, you know across the board sevens worldwide or is that just something we've experienced in our little ecosystem it, it's so great that you experienced that at the Dodger Sevens because it is something that is universal around the world. And the, the, the very first time I noticed it on the Sevens World Series actually was uh, going to stay at the same hotel with all the other uh, World Series Sevens teams. And then you're there all week, so you're having breakfast together, lunch, everything else like that. Now, what I probably will say that lends itself to it is the game. Seven, seven aside, while it is physical, there is, you know, there's less argy-bargy, if you will, less punch-ups. It, it, it's, a, it's a funner environment. And you're at unbelievable destinations. And, and so the, the people are more relaxed, I think, in the game itself. And then you're with each other all the time. With, and even if you go to a local tournament that you're not there the whole week, you will still play in that tournament and then all go out together, right? Go to the same social, the same after party, yeah. the meal and drinks. And it is a fun setting and, 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 and a really great vibe. I mean, those are probably some of the best memories that play, people that play at the sport have is, is being on a sevens tour. And what I will say, too, maybe is that it's – because everybody's kind of like, the, I suppose the egos are left aside, you know, it's, you, you're just there for a good time. And, and of course, there's, there's no better way to do so than carving it up with a few tries and then a few jars afterwards. And some beer pong in the evening. Talk about some of these tournaments. So back when you were playing, what sort of, uh, you know, name some of the players you were running out with. Yeah, so the, the era that, that I played in was for the US, uh, we weren't a core team, uh, meaning we only were invited to a few tournaments. So we got invited to the, the North American legs, uh, and then we played in, um, actually, sorry, it was USA leg, New Zealand, and Hong Kong. So those are three we played in, and we did really well there. And the players that are my, on the, the team that I played alongside were Chris Wiles, um, uh, who ended up having a brilliant career for Saracens. Yeah, of Saracens. Great uh, Taku Nguenya, who, who, so Taku and I were the two Africans in the team because he was from Zimbabwe <laughs> and I'm from South Africa. And then the next year, he runs around Brian Habana. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so it was amazing. So we had him. We obviously had Todd Clever, uh, the face the face and the hair of USA Rugby, which is yeah. blowing in the wind, the Baywatch. Um, what other players coming through? Kevin Swern did really well, 15s and 7s for the US, um, and a handful of other players. But players, players against, this is where it's, it's, it was always amazing and such an honor, right? Being such a fan of rugby, to be able to play in a tournament like that, it was just a dream come true. But I'll never forget having to do research on Fiji when we were playing them. And my opposite number uh, was Waisali Serevi. <laughs> And then, and then, and then, outside him was William Ryder, who William Ryder back in the day could step step people like park cars, you know, um, it was yeah. unbelievable. 
And so doing re research on those teams, Samoa had their best players that have played in their era, like Lola Louie and Uwali Ua Mai and um, uh, Michele Pesamino. So it, it was just crazy. New Zealand, uh, let's see some of the names there. As I said, um, uh, uh, Victor Vito was a big one, played on the wing in yeah, the seventh. Victor, wow. Zar Lawrence was amazing. Uh, James O'Connor for Australia. Scored, he scored a hat-trick against us, and he was 17 years old. We're like, who is this kid? Uh, so he was good. The Honey Badger played against him. Oh. So it was – and, and, and uh, for England, who did they have? They had um, – so Simon Amor, who was obviously coaching now, was playing. So a lot of the guys that are coaching were involved in the thing. Mm. I actually was cleaning up some uh, uh, storage stuff I had, and I found a bunch of old programs. And so it's really cool to go through all the names from the different countries to see who played in that, that same tournament. You had uh, Ben Gollings? So Ben Gollings was, was the ultimate, yeah. So Ben Gollings for England, um, I mean, his kicking was unbelievable. His, his ability to support play, his vision. Uh, Santiago Gomez scored, top try score at that point for Argentina. Uh, every try scored, he kicked and regathered. It was amazing. Uh, so all those kind of legends uh, uh, in, in the same era. So it's really cool to then be involved now on the commentating side uh, where, you know, you can talk about the older days and then, you know, the new proper players coming through. Um, the Colin Isles and the Perry Bakers for the US. I mean, they, they've changed the game, you know, so. They're so different, aren't they? Yeah. So you, what are your uh, commentary partners, Sean Maloney? Yeah, so, so well, there's, 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 a, there's a handful of us that do each tournament, and uh, Sean Maloney is, and myself, our first voice, so we're the play-by-play uh, -play commentators, and then Carl Tanana is second voice. So because I, I started out as an analyst, so second voice, so I work with Sean a lot. But since then, I've done, which is I'm more familiar with play-by-play. -play. So we will never work together actually calling a game. So it'll be Carl Tanana and myself or Rob Vickerman from England yeah. um, or uh, Tiana Penitani from Australia. So you can, we kind of mix up the accents like that. It's got a really nice balance in the group. Um, that And so I'll give you a little story about the Hong Kong Sevens if you want, if you have time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. So being such a fan of the Sevens, Hong Kong was the ultimate, right? Everybody spoke about Hong Kong and like, wow, yeah. it would be amazing to go there. So after a couple of years in the U.S., it was before I made the national team, um, I had a club side uh, and they were like, cool, we're going to go play in the Hong Kong Tens and then we're going to go watch the Sevens. So this was the, the, the biggest thing I've ever heard of. So we go play in the Tens and it was the level there was the next level. Like uh, recently retired Australian forward Tota Kefu was playing for one of the ten sides. And I was playing sweeper, and he just came across and just obviously ran me over, like, to the ground. So, anyway, so we, we started the drinking weekend early because, you know, we're done with the tents, knocked out early, and uh, we had some good parties. And I remember, Hong Kong's a three-day tournament, and so we wanted to get, at 8 a.m., we wanted to get into the stadium to, to uh, get to the South Stand, which is the most infamous cheering section. Yeah. And so we, we partied quite hard on the Thursday uh, night, and the tournament starts on the Friday. So we all come back to the hotel and we come back to the hotel and everyone's like, cool, we're getting ready to go out. I'm like, getting ready to go out where? They're like, no, we're going to the stadium now. I'm like, and so we didn't realize that it was pretty late, you know, Hong Kong time. And so we went straight to the stadium, got our places in the South Stand, ready for, you know, 40,000 fans to go wild and everything else. And while we're in the South Stand, we're, you know, we're cheering, we're getting riled up, getting some pictures. I slip on one of the, one of the, <laughs> the chairs and fall and cut my head open. And so... Basically, at nine in the morning, I have to get dollied out of the stadium to get stitches next door and wheel, and wheel back in before a single player has even arrived. <laughs> oh, anyway, cut to... Cut, As, cut to say, Jack, Jack can some, some, you know, rival your, your injury things. He can exactly. eat, you know, fall over a, a banana skin and get injured a lot of the time. Oh, cheers, mate. Cheers. <laughs> um, sorry, saying, saying that, i got just a couple of things. Obviously, you, you mentioned a name there. <laughs> You mentioned Will Ryder. I remember I had a bit of a fangirl moment when I was a kid and I went to the London Sevens and got my picture. Absolute hero, legend of the game. I've got an obsession with Fiji rugby. But um, you saying about sort of the seven, like going around the world, at the moment, we've obviously got a lot of different nations who don't actually host a Sevens tournament on the circuit. Are there any nations in particular you would love to see who don't currently actually host a seven Series weekend? That's a, that's a brilliant point. So Fiji comes to mind straight away because the Pacific Island nation, the most obsessed about sevens out of everybody, and, and the fact that they don't have a tournament is tough. And I know logistically and getting a stadium and that sort of stuff, but I think they would be amazing. I also think, you know, a place like Kenya would be superb. They have a, a their famous tournament, the Safari Sevens, very well attended, um, and, and Kenya just loved the sport of rugby too. Um Scotland didn't do a great job for getting people out there when it was at Murrayfield, so I feel for them for sure. 
uh, let me think, what other countries off the top of my head? Um, I think in, in Asia too, the game is certainly certainly exploding. So it'd be interesting to see how, because they've got to go in pairs, right? So if you did have like, so South Africa has one and then Kenya has one, that makes sense. And in Asia, you've got Hong Kong, you could potentially go across um, and, and revive maybe a China or uh, Japan or something like that, you know? So yeah. uh, would, well, a, a, anyone spring to your mind that you think of? I, again, I probably thought Fiji originally, obviously they've got the stadium at Suva, but like you said, sort of logistics and everything. And um, I don't know even, because there's not, is there a leg in Argentina at the moment? So there was there was one in you're right. Mar del Plata was a leg in Argentina, and they haven't uh, gone back since. Argentina would be great. Uh, I got a chance to go there for the World Rugby Under 20 Championship uh, last year, and it was amazing. Uh, they do love their rugby there too, and a great atmosphere too, because there's a lot of uh, uh, you know meat getting getting cooked. Uh, they love their drinks, they love their sports, and so they're, they're definitely the best culture for it. Um, the other thing I was going to say, we we had a. Again, Neil sort of mentioned my banana skins. I'm not the greatest fan of these uh, artificial pitches, but uh, again, that's a different debate. Um, I found it very interesting, particularly watching um, watching the Vancouver Sevens. Absolutely amazing setup over there, and looks fantastic. And the amount of work actually they did off field with the Ronald McDonald help and everything like that. It's interesting to see, particularly like South Sea Islanders, Fiji did not want to necessarily play too much rugby on that is that something that you feel really benefits sides who have the experience or do you feel sevens in particular would benefit from playing more on an artificial surface or on a natural surface i think there's a bit of a debate about the surface uh the my first experience on the surface actually was here in, in los angeles where i know i was coaching at a college team here and they had a brilliant artificial uh, pitch i was initially like oh this is going to be a bit weird and how will the ball bounce but diving around and sliding around if it's watered and done properly actually was was brilliant and the great thing about obviously you know having fields like that outside of the sevens world series is that you can play on a 24 7 uh, and everybody can have a go in different sports so i do i do think it's more cost effective there particularly if you're in a country that rains a lot and fields get messed up or games postponed I, I, i'm all for that um and i know that um uh, you know, a couple of the Super Rugby sides have, have played on mixed mixed turf. It, when it comes to the Sevens, one thing I did notice, though, is that uh, the Vancouver Sevens, everybody's taping their, their elbows and taping yeah. their knees and stuff like that, and that doesn't look good, you know, and you don't want to give that perception. I didn't get a chance to ask the players, but the week before in Las Vegas, generally that's what people got torn up on. They, they, they got, their, their skin got taken off a bit, so that field was probably a bit too dry in the desert. What, and they didn't maintain it properly because they don't really play any other sports there outside of that. So yeah. I, that's where the issue was. So this year, even though it was in Los Angeles, people in their mind were like, well, hold on, we wore tape last year and they kind of assumed it was that field. Mm -hmm. The pitch is actually actually totally fine. And I don't see I don't see a real issue with it. Um, now, again, saying that if you're playing in a closed dome stadium, you, you know, you technically could have grass because you could, you know, you could open it up type thing. So um, I, I, I'm still 50-50 on that. Um, again, if it's if it's for the betterment of you know playing all year round, I'd say, I'd say absolutely go for it. As far as international teams go, look, I think we're moving you know in, in every way we're trying to move the sport forward, right? And so if it helps the ground staff and helps them keep the field, uh, like I know that some of the turf fields, uh, some of the regular grass fields, sometimes when the big scrum comes together and you see it gets dug up, you don't want that, right? Um, no. But that's gonna gonna mess it up underfoot, you know. I prefer uh, uh, I prefer four G pitches. Yeah, yeah so much better. Yeah, I, I do, but there's a there's an argument that um, injuries happen a lot easier on them, isn't it? Because there's less give, um, you know, there's it's, it's high impact injuries because of the pace you go in, because of the you know hits on that surface. I've heard that it can be a lot a lot worse for injuries. Is that the case or? Is that yeah, so 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 I would have to you have to look more at the evidence. But you're right. If the if the evidence is leaning slightly towards that, then you're right. Then you're probably better advised to play on, on, on a surface that, that has more give. Um, I haven't seen all the statistics on that yet, but if that is the case, that is probably the one thing you do want to avoid. Obviously, in rugby, you want to keep your injuries down to a minimum. And I think it's particularly in the States, we pride ourselves saying our sport's safer. And when I when I speak to parents when I was doing a lot of youth development with the kids, I would say, rugby's safer than football. And everyone's like freaking out. They're like, no, but you don't wear helmets or pads. I go, <laughs> that's why it's safer. And they were like, immediately you can see they're, they're, they're like, hold on, what are you going to say next? Because you, you're lying to me. So I kept saying, which is true, because you're not wearing a helmet, uh, you're never going to lead with your head in a tackle. 
because you're going to get knocked out. So you yeah. always use your shoulder and you use the safety first. So then the parents who are like, oh, that makes total sense. You add the helmet. It actually is more dangerous because you lead with your head diving into people. And so that's kind of a, a good explanation of that, you know. Yeah. Sorry, Jack. Oh. So go, go with that. Um, the, the perception of rugby, I mean, I used to play American football over here, um, only for a little Gloucester side. Uh, I played defensive end. I absolutely loved it. And all I can say is the season afterwards, I went back, started playing rugby, and I was eating like a steam train. But the, <laughs> I had an American quarterback, right? I had an American quarterback and uh, Derek, and he used to hate me because in, in practice, I used to hit him on his ass every, all day, every day. And um, I tried to say to him, Look, you know, you used to get in hits and stuff. Why don't you come and play rugby? Nah, man, you guys are crazy. You like stick, you know, the, the, the perception that he had, I won't go into what he actually said and what he thinks rugby players do to each other. Um, but do you find, is that, is that across the board? Do Americans, do you think there's a, a, a difficulty in recruiting new players for teams over there, maybe even at a grassroots level because of perception in sport? Yes, the perception is definitely there. And, and the perception here in the US didn't help that um, at college, when people were growing up here many years ago, the perception of rugby was hooligan sport, like no rules, yeah. massive drinking culture, uh, and doing silly things, you know, uh, when they're, when they're out and about as a team. So that that definitely is a perception that's slowly changing in the U.S. because of more professional rugby being shown and the game and, and and the values that come with it as well. But I will say, when you chat to the average sports person here that plays football or doesn't, and you mention rugby, you instantly get respect because they're like, oh wow. That sport's hardcore is what they say straight away. And the first thing they'll say is, you're not wearing any pads. You guys are crazy. And so that's why, you know, I keep laughing with them saying, well, to be fair, it's safer. And they they were like, couldn't, couldn't believe it. So you get respect straight away. And yeah. so I haven't been in any brawls. But if I was to be in a brawl, I'd just say, hey, I'll play rugby. <laughs> then people would be like, oh, okay, there's a rugby player. So you know, the but, roses in the river. Everyone just yeah, part, exactly. parted straight away. Exactly. <laughs> but, 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 but saying that, there are, there are quite a lot of players that are switching to rugby. You know, it's increasing each year. Players like, um, you know, Carl and Isles, once they, you know, get into the local media a lot and they talk about their transition, not from football, but their transition from another sport to rugby and how mm -hmm. it, 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 that jump can be made, you'll see a lot more people doing it. And Nate Ebner, who plays uh, for the, the uh, Patri New, uh, New England Patriots, yeah, yeah. a three-time Su Super Bowl winner, so he's a good advocate of that who basically talks up how positive rugby is on, on the environment, on, on the uh, the, the team surrounding and how oh, what a great sport it is. And then, of course, um, a while back when the um, uh, the Seattle side won, uh, Pete Carroll, their coach, credited his defensive tackling expert who came from rugby um, and is why that side was was able to to be the best defensive team in the league. And so those crossovers on, haven't gone unnoticed here in, in, the, in the, the sporting community. Mm. Very good. Very you, you said that and Neil bringing up the American football, that was actually similar to my question. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> sorry, no, no, no. How many different sports do you actually find in that are you've got players transitioning from those? But obviously, people go to college and university on big scholarships now, and there are massive. And hopefully, rugby is starting to get a similar program. Um, is there a real variety of sports that people are actually transitioning from at quite a late age, or is it quite an early age now? So I would say uh, the, 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 the easiest crossover which spoke about is at the college level. So even that college team I coached here called Occidental College, where Barack Obama actually went to that, that college uh, uh, back in the day, their football players, uh, you know, have, have, an, have an off season and the rugby season happens to be in that time period. So several of them would come out and play rugby to keep fit for football. And they loved it so much that they would stay with the sport. And the, our rugby team, you know, instantly became so much better once we had five or six big, strong football players that could handle the ball and, and, and join the game. Wrestling is another sport where a lot of crossover comes from. Um, the most unique crossover sport that I've ever heard of is uh, cheerleading. There is a, a Joe Schrader who plays for the USA Sevens team was a cheerleader at college. Um, and he was the base that everybody jumps on and does that thing. And then he came. Oh, yeah. Game yeah, a professional rate player, which is probably the most unique one. But I say sport that lends itself to physical contact, like a wrestling, like like like, like a football. Um, you you see more players coming through like that. But there are you know unique stories of soccer players coming through. If you speak yeah. to a couple of American fly halves, they played soccer, so that kind of skill set goes hand in hand. Um, but there's there is the you know there's so many sports played here. You do see a lot of people getting hooked, and the the story is always the same. They're like a friend a friend invited me to come to rugby. I didn't know what I was doing. I got a bloody nose, but I loved it, and I came back. And that's kind of what, what what happens the whole time, you know. 
Brilliant. Awesome. Well, uh, go on. No, no, I was just saying a good way to get into rugby. Yes, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they all point out too that the social element is what they really enjoyed about it. And it, that is unique and sets the sport aside where the teams meet up with the opposition and have a bite to eat and have some have some drinks, where the other sports that they're used to, that doesn't happen. In fact, you, you're taught to dislike the enemy, um, you know, all your chance of, you know, uh, uh, you know, at them, and then afterwards you go separate ways. So uh, rugby here in the U.S. culturally um, is a great team sport, and that's why I think also at the younger levels it's growing because it's you can play it at you know non-contact level, co-ed level, and you're just promoting everybody to be equal on the field. Where in football, there's a quarterback as you as you guys just pointed out, and that player is the star. Everything runs around that player. Well, rugby, they, you know, as we all know, everybody has to defend and has to uh, attack as well. On the social side of things, sorry guys. Uh, on the social side of things, now going back to this American, this American football team I played, we had an American uh, American coach. Now, I don't know if this is the same across the whole of the USA, but in, in England, I've always been taught: win, lose, or draw. You get on the beer, you celebrate, you commiserate, whatever. You have a good, you know, coach trip on the way back. You all get drunk and sing songs. Now, me and two of the other rugby players on the coach. Um, lost this game in Coventry, we were on the way back, started singing songs, and the coach went absolute ballistic at us. Now, is that American sporting mentality as a whole? Is it, you know, if you don't win, you don't celebrate, that's it, you sit there glum, and, and, or is it just difference in sports, you think? Yes, yeah, so that's an interesting one for sure. Uh, I would probably say it's, it is the difference, difference in the sports um, yeah. where – you know, even the traditional uh, coach on the side who's shouting at his players and going absolutely berserk is very stereotypical of American football, where rugby, it's like, well, the coach has kind of done their job, right? Until when the game kicks off, unless you can make some substitutes or get a couple of messages on, your coaching's kind of done. Um, but I, I haven't heard too many stories about, as you said, kind of stopping that kind of camaraderie afterwards, uh, which is a bit sad because you're right. In rugby, it's like, well, you've lost the game. I mean, it, you know, nothing you can do about it now. You can focus on it later, but, you know, you should enjoy each other's companies and lift each other up for sure. I haven't, I mean, we've had a couple of um, American coaches like coaching us in the sevens. Um, mm. They were a bit stricter. I will say they were a bit stricter on those kind of things. We yeah. try to have our, our fun, but obviously we take it seriously, the game. So we're not, degrading. I think that's where the coaches get confused, where they're like, well, hold on, you've just lost. You're not taking this seriously. You're like, well, it's done now. We we are allowed to have a bit of fun. Come Monday or the next training session, we'll be switched on, ready to go. But we need to let up a bit of steam. And and if you do bottle it up too much, you your team will rebel, rebel quite a bit, you know. So with our sevens, when we were playing, we you know we we had fun and had a laugh and made fun of each other and you know get those chirps going. We obviously wouldn't go out drinking because we were preparing for these World Seven Series tournaments. But once the tournaments were done, we'd all meet up and go out afterwards. The coach would never join us because he wasn't really into that, and that's. The, you know, totally their thing. But I think it's vital for the chemistry of the team to do that, you know? I bet those nights got messy, didn't they? <laughs> I bet there's a few stories about those nights you're holding back and stuff. <laughs> As you can tell, Neil Neil loves the social aspect of rugby. Oh, yes. oh, yes. hey, it's, it is one of, the, one of the best. I mean, it's, it's a, a, it's a yeah. shame you can't drink. Yeah. <laughs> they call me, uh, me Tintin. That's because we went to one of the tournaments and I was being sick after two tins of lager. <laughs> Simpson, that's brilliant. See, it's that's just lager. I can't drink lager full stop. A cider, I'm, I'm a West Country bumpkin. I can drink cider all day long. But, but lager, that, oh. That's the great thing about rugby, the nicknames, right? The, the yeah. fun you had. I mean, like, so I, I remember, uh, uh, you know, you nickname a couple of people in your team. And uh, after two or three years playing club rugby in the U.S., we'd get an email from one of the teams and, like, the guy's name came up and – First thing people wrote without even taking meaning to be funny were like, sorry, who is this? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to initiate that and dodge a bit more, a few more nicknames. Yeah. I think we do, it needs to be a good one for Dom, but uh, it'll take a while to think of, I think. Yeah, it's it's got to happen that, organically. It's got to happen yeah. on the job. Something will yeah. come up. Right? Perfect. Well, uh, yeah, I think we've hit the 40, 45 minute mark. Dallin, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, and hopefully, once this all passed, we'll get you back on the TV listening to some of your excellent commentary. Well, thank you very much, Dom. Thanks, Neil and Jack. Really appreciate right. it. And thanks for everything you're doing that side. And, and particularly, I love the Dodger Sevens and I love what you guys stand for and what you promote. Uh, so, uh, so happy to be on here and look forward to, to getting back on again soon. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, right. thanks. thanks very much.